Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Bellevue City Council meeting for September 18th, 2023. Uh, we do not have Council Member Robertson here with us tonight. Uh, we had a very successful wine walk last weekend uh, put on by uh, the old Bellevue Merchants Association and our city staff. They worked very hard to actually close off a portion of Main Street so people could enjoy walking around with their glass. Well, actually, you can't walk with your glass. You had to drink it inside the facility. The, but um, walking around and not worrying about cars. And so it was very successful, and I wanted to congratulate uh, the staff for all their work on that. And I know the city manager's dream was always to see what it would be like to have a portion of old Main Street closed, and it was awesome. Um, city clerk, could you call the roll, please? Thank you, Mayor Robinson. Here. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse. Here. Councilmember Barksdale. Here. Councilmember Lee. Here. Councilmember uh, Stokes. Here. And Councilmember Zahn. Here. And Councilmember <clears throat> Robertson is absent. Please join me in the flag salute. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have three proclamations tonight. The first one is National Hispanic Heritage Month proclamation, which will be read by Councilmember Lee, and it will be received by representatives from a youth program called Latino Heat, which stands for Espanos en Acción Together, which is part of the Youth Eastside Services. And I think we have Anthony Nunez coming to accept the award tonight. Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Whereas Hispanic Heritage Month celebrates the culture and contributions of Americans tracing their roots to Spain, Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Spanish-speaking nations of the Caribbean. And whereas the observations started in 1968 under President Lyndon Johnson, it was expanded by President Ronald Reagan in 1988 to cover a 30-day period beginning every year on September 15th. And whereas the month of September is significant because it marks the anniversaries of independence for the Latin American countries of Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, which celebrate on September 15th, Mexico on September 16th, and Chile on September 18th. And whereas Hispanic residents represent Bellevue's third largest population group, comprising about 7% of the population, and whereas Bellevue's welcoming community and National Hispanic Heritage Month is an important reminder of how much strength we draw as a region from our immigrant roots and our values as a nation of immigrants. And whereas the cultural, educational, and economic influence of Hispanic community members enrich all aspects of life here in the Puget Sound region and throughout the East Side. Whereas Bellevue welcomes the linguistic, familial, and social wealth shared by all the Hispanic communities and throughout the cross-culture center without wars. We invite the public to learn about the diversity within this community. Now, therefore, I, Conrad Lee, on behalf of <coughs> Lynn Robinson, Mayor of the City of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of the City Council, to hereby proclaim September 15th through October 15th, 2023, as National Hispanic Heritage Month, and call upon all Bellevue residents to observe this month and celebrate the contribution of Hispanic neighbors with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities, including a public performance of Living Voices, La Cosa, in City Hall's Council Chamber on Thursday, October 12th. Thank you. Thank you, you Councilmember Lee. Um, Anthony Nunez, would you like to come speak? And then you know what? We'll do uh, pictures after the other two proclamations, so I'll ask you to come back for a picture. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. I'll actually like to extend the, the invitation of La Causa uh, performance happening on October 12th, open for the public. So the guests here, um, I welcome them to come join us. Uh, at 6.30, there's gonna be a Danza Azteca, a dance performance, as well as the, um, the Living Voices uh, performance. So please come join us and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say on behalf of uh, all of the uh, Latino Heat members and uh, of all, you know, Latino uh, citizens or people who live in Bellevue, thank you for giving us this opportunity. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Stick around. The next one is World Alzheimer Day, which will be read by Council Member Barksdale. And I think Abigail Brown from the uh, Bellevue Network on Aging will be here to accept that. Whereas it is important to honor the dignity of thousands of people in Bellevue impacted by Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, diseases for which there is currently no proven means of prevention, treatment, or cure. And whereas Alzheimer's disease is a growing public health crisis in Washington, 120,000 people in the state are now living with Alzheimer's disease, relying on nearly 300,000 unpaid family caregivers, providing 434 million hours of unpaid care and support to their loved ones. And whereas in 2023, an estimated 6.7 million people in the United States, 65 and older, are living with Alzheimer's disease and the Alzheimer's Association expects that number to more than double by 2060, unless medical breakthroughs lead to the prevention, slowing, or cure for Alzheimer's disease. And whereas Alzheimer's impacts are universal and not restricted by location, income, or identity, and recognizing the dignity of individuals while also promoting a better understanding of the disease can help individuals, families, and caregivers. Whereas World Alzheimer's Day uh, takes place annually on September 21st and is a day during which Bellevue community members can join others from across the globe to raise awareness and challenge the stigma that surrounds Alzheimer's. Now, therefore, I, on behalf, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, Mayor of the City of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of its City Council, do hereby proclaim September 21, 2023 as World Alzheimer's Day in Bellevue and urge all residents to join in this observance and learn more ways to get involved or donate in support of the care, support, and research that helps our neighbors and family members facing Alzheimer's by visiting alzwa.org. Thank you. I don't have a long set of prepared comments. Um, this is personal for me. Some of you already know this. Um, I'm a longtime caregiver um, of a parent who had Alzheimer's for more than a decade. And I have two other family members, aunts, that also had dementia. And so this, this means a lot, and I wanted to just extend uh, my thanks and the thanks on behalf of the Bellevue Network on Aging, of which I'm a chair. Um, thank you for this acknowledgement, this acknowledgement for individuals and families and caregivers of people who have Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. Thank you. Thank you for your work on the Bellevue Network on Aging. So have a seat, stick around, we'll do a picture uh, together. And uh, next up we have the National Service. What? Could I say something here? Oh, sure. Yeah. I just want to say my appreciation as uh, my wife died with Alzheimer's two years ago, and I appreciate this very much. And I don't have my mic on. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate this very much, and we hope that we can make progress. My wife died from Alzheimer's two years ago, and uh, it's um, it's just not not a, uh, anyhow, it's it's really great to see the community come together and work on this. We'll, we'll, we'll conquer it at some time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stokes. Next is we have the National Service Dog Month <clears throat> Proclamation, uh, read by Council Member Stokes and accepted by Naomi Martini and her service dog, Windsor. Okay, thank you. Uh, this proclamation, uh, whereas the Americans with Disabilities Act protects the rights of protected populations to access public spaces, including access for individually, individually trained service dogs, doing work or performing tasks for the benefit of people with a disability, and whereas in the United States only 16,000 service dogs from accredited training programs exist nationwide, and the need is growing. And whereas a number of nonprofit organizations in our region enhance the lives of people with disabilities by equitably 
providing expertly trained service dogs, ongoing services, and a committed community of support. And whereas National Service Dog Month aims to educate our community about the benefit of service dogs and the laws protecting them. And whereas the City of Bellevue recognizes an inclusive community where all community members and their service dogs are embraced and welcome. Now, therefore, I, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, Mayor of Bellevue, Washington, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim September 2023 as National Service Dog Month in Bellevue and encourage community members to celebrate <clears throat> these task-trained uh, <clears throat> task service animals and respect the rights of adults and children who lead more independent lives because of their assistance. Thank you. And uh, Naomi, did you have anything you wanted to say? Naomi is um, from the Puget Sound chapter of Canine Companions for Independence. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody on this council on behalf of the service dog organizations all over the country and from Canine Companions here today. We have some special guests in the audience. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of service dogs everywhere and thank you for your continued support for our community. Thank you. Let's do a picture with you first and your everybody in the audience that you brought with you. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda, please? I move to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, next up we have oral communications. City Clerk, do we have anybody signed up? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. There are four pre-registered speakers this evening. And before I get started, <clears throat> excuse me, calling names, I need to remind the public of a few of the rules that the council has in place. So the total time for our oral communications is for a period not to exceed 30 minutes. Um, persons speaking to items on tonight's agenda will be called first, and if time remains, others will be called after that. The presiding officer is authorized in both of those categories to give preference to those who haven't spoken to the council within the last 60 days, or who are speaking to items that will come on the agenda within the next 60 days. Speakers will be allowed three minutes to speak, or up to three minutes, and a maximum of three speakers are allowed to speak to any one side of a particular topic. And I need to remind everyone that in compliance with Washington State campaign laws regarding the use of public facilities during elections, that no speaker may support or oppose a ballot measure um, or oppose a candidate for an election, which would include your own campaign. Any speaker who begins discussing topics of this nature will be asked to stop. And with that, I'll call our first speaker, who is Craig Spiesel. Oh, oh there we go. Good evening. My name is Craig Spiesel, a Bellevue resident. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of a coalition of Bellevue residents and businesses who are concerned regarding the direction council is taking pertaining to the TBD. I first want to also point out that my comments tonight were based on the ordinance, which was originally scheduled and still posted on the website for tonight's meeting. Um, the public was not notice or, or no, provided notice that that has changed or the timeline has been updated. So these comments are still relevant. Um, I first want to thank the Deputy Mayor and Council Members Lee and Zahn for attempting to put the brakes on this process. Thank you very much. And second, I also want to acknowledge the Mayor and Council Mayor Robertson for engaging with the public. While we, agree, while we disagree in the need and the supporting data and urgency, they've been willing to have a dialogue, and that's very important. So thank you again. That said, the TPD is shaping up to be one of the most controversial issues the Council has been faced with and I believe will be a defining moment of the legacy of this council. There has been unanimous community opposition in the formation of the TBD, and it's important to recognize that the issue is not just about attacks. The bigger issue is the process and how it was fast-tracked without data, transparency, fiscal governance, and budget prioritization. This does not represent due diligence. I stand before you with a simple request. Before you force taxpayers to open our wallets, you, the city, needs to look at what money you already have in your wallet. You might be surprised what you find. So where do we go from here? Council can approve the ordinance disregarding the public concerns voiced over the past two months. Number two, you could place a hiatus on the ordinance for six months or more. 
recognizing that 57% of the council seats are up for re-election in six weeks. Council should allow the incoming council to vote on this pivotal issue. Third, consider amendments into the ordinance which would establish guardrails to help address the community concerns. These recommended amendments include one or A, before any taxes are approved, council should direct the city manager to review all budget for opportunities to reallocate funds to support the transportation requirements. B, require voter approval for any tax or fee as provided by RCW 36.73. C, establish a sunset clause for any approved taxes of no more than two years and require voter approval for any such extension. And D, require the transportation department to identify and seek council's approval for any capital projects to be funded by the TBD. So in summary, I wanna thank you for your time. It's important that we work together to keep the TPD from fracturing the community and focus on the trust that the city has built with the community over the past 70 years. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Don Marsh. Good evening. My name is Don Marsh. You might remember me as the co-founder and president of the Coalition of Eastside Neighborhoods for Sensible Energy. I now serve as the co-founder and vice president of 300 Trees and as a board member for Trees for Livability. But tonight, I'm speaking as a member of Sierra Club's Washington State Energy Committee, representing thousands of Sierra Club members who are also customers of PSE. I'm here to voice our concerns about a very questionable energy project that will impact Bellevue and more than a million PSE customers who will pay higher electricity bills for decades to pay for the project. As you may know, PSE is pursuing a land use permit to build the north segment of its Energize Eastside transmission line. In its land use application, PSE cites an environmental impact study that is eight years old and woefully out of date. The EIS evaluated conditions for an east side grid with much less emergency capacity than we have today. It generally dismissed technology alternatives that have become much less expensive and more capable during the past decade. It assumed state and federal government policies that have now been changed to address the threat of climate change. Sierra Club believes the North Segment is an obsolete proposal that does not increase reliability, capacity, or access to clean energy. And the cost of the project is high. In, addis in addition to raising our electric bills, PSE proposes to cut down hundreds of valuable urban trees in central Bellevue that already suffers from summer temperatures 10 degrees hotter than neighborhoods with more tree canopy. The affected neighborhoods house some of our city's least affluent and most diverse residents. Before the city approves a huge infrastructure project that would increase risks for our residents, increase our energy bills, destroy natural resources, and inflict months of intrusive and inconvenient construction on everyone, let's make sure this project actually improves reliability to customers as mandated by Bellevue's land use code. We ask the City Council to join us in asking for a supplemental EIS to specifically address our questions and ensure our sacrifices are actually benefiting the city. Let's demonstrate our shared commitment to protecting the well-being of our trees, our wildlife, our residents, and future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Bill Hurd. My name is Bill Hurt, and I've lived at 2615 170th Avenue Southeast since 1967. More than a decade ago, I made several presentations to the council attempting to persuade them not to allow the 10 permits sound transit needed for East Link. The council chose to ignore me, and I'm here tonight because one of the results of that decision the East Link starter line debut next month. 
next March, excuse me. Sound Transit intends to operate two car trains between FTC and South Bellevue TC every 10 minutes, every 10 minutes for 16 hours a day. I'm here tonight to prevent stutter line operation from being an environmental nightmare for those living along the route, exceeding the noise levels of Bellevue Municipal Code. It limits those levels to 55 dB in residential areas and 60 dB in commercial. Those limits resulted in Sound Transit spending millions to shield homes along the route into Belleville. However, they have made no attempts to shield those along the route between the RTC and Bellevue, instead approving a memorandum that limits their need to mitigate the noise to whatever their CEO thinks is reasonable. All right. I'm here tonight to publicly tell you that the only way that the starter line would not create, uh, would, not, would not exceed the noise code is to dramatically slow the trains. That the, saddle, that the council should insist sound transit's reasonable and feasible noise mitigation include limiting speeds to as low as 15 to 20 miles an hour. That's the only way they can ever achieve that noise goal. Thank you. Thank you. The final list, or the final speaker on our list is Alex Zimmerman. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's a problem for me, sit down. I'm so sorry. Zikhail, a damn Nazi Gestapo fascist, a bandita, a mafia a bandita who support Iranian Muslim and Russian terrorist. So what is my name, Alex Zimmerman, and I live in Bellevue more than 35 years. I want to speak about something what is for me look absolutely sick, you know what it mean? It's Iranian Muslim, it's Iranian Muslim president, humiliate America, harassment America, in American people, you know what it mean? When Republic Democrat talk about give them six billion dollars, pardon, but he sends his President Biden, Democrat, you know what is mean, far away. I never like see this before, you know what is mean. And after this, we give six billion dollars for who? And what is they use six billion dollars for make atomic bomb? They have right now three ready atomic bomb, but it will destroy Israel, eight million Jew. In New York, you know what this means, 12 million people. This is exactly what's happened. So my question right now, very simple. Why Democrat acting like an enemy of America and American people, you know what this means, support us enemy who can destroy America, who can destroy all world, you know what this means? Is this make me totally sick, you know what this means? This article, what is Seattle Times, what is Seattle Times, print in 30 of August, support Iranian Muslims. I try to understand why is going on, you know what this mean? Why people in Seattle and King Country, you know what this mean, in Bellevue, support Democrat? Are they all sick? Are mentally sick, you know what this mean? Don't understand, so Democrat is a mafia, organized criminal who hate America and American people? Why this happen, you know what this mean? It's confused me totally. I live here 35 years and I don't understand how is this possible. 85 percentage vote for Democrat. The same percentage what is vote for Adolf Gilter Nazi, you know what this mean? In Nazi 39. And Nazi destroy country totally. And Democrat, right now, we can see this. It's very simple. Destroy everything, you know what this mean? What does America have? It's a nightmare. And exactly for every percentage people who totally poor right now, guy before, I support him by 100 percentage. Yes, you need post to be look how much money we have in our pocket. And after this, make this decision. 
So I speak right now to everybody. Stand up, America. Stand up, Bellevue. Stand up, King Country. Destroy this Democrat mafia, this bandita, you know what it means, and clean this chamber totally, because they control a state for more than 30 years. It's a pure, pure fascism. Thank you very much for your time. That's the end of our pre-registered list of speakers this evening. I'd ask at this point if there's anyone else joining us in council chambers who would like to speak. Uh, please raise your hand. That goes for those online joining us as well. If you would like to speak, please use the raise hand function. Okay. No additional hands, Mayor. I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. City Manager, you have something wonderful. Yes, um, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. <clears throat> I have one item under the city manager's report um, tonight, which is a really a good news story, and that is a recognition of one of our police officers, Officer Akahani, um, by the Carnegie Hero Fund Commission. Uh, just by way of background, the Carnegie Hero Fund Commission was created to recognize outstanding acts of selfless heroism performed in the United States and Canada. The commission awards the Carnegie Mellon to those who risk their lives to an extraordinary degree while saving or attempting to save the lives of others. The single event that drove Mr. Carnegie to organize this fund was the Harwick Mine disaster near Pittsburgh in January of 1904, which claimed 181 lives. The victims included an engineer and a miner who went into the stricken mine in a valiant attempt to rescue others. The tragedy and sacrifices moved Mr. Carnegie so much that he, he promptly took action on this then novel idea of honoring and helping heroes of civilization. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chief Wendell Shirley to, um, to, to talk about some of the details Officer Akani uh, accomplished uh, recently. So, Chief. Thank you, City Manager. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. Uh, we're very happy to be here uh, to honor Officer um, Akahani, who's right here to my right. Um, on June 6, 2022, Officer Akahani saved a 17-year-old boy from drowning after a young man wearing a backpack filled with 50 pounds of weights entered Phantom Lake. Officer Akahani and his partners were dispatched, dispatched to the scene where after searching, they saw the boy's hand under the surface of the water at the end of the pier. In full uniform, which included his boots and ballistic vest, Officer Akahani climbed over the wooden rails and jumped into the 50-degree water, where he submerged three times before finding the young man in the murky water. He pulled him to the surface and brought him to the pier. Officer Akahani pushed the boy, who was by then unconscious, upward and officers on the pier uh, pulled him from the water where they performed CPR. The great news is a young man was taken to the hospital by ambulance and he survived. Bellevue firefighters assisted Officer Akahani from the water. He was cold and nearly exhausted. So we're here tonight to, to honor Officer Akahani for his courageous service. Thank you, Mayor. Officer Akahani, I know that you and your colleagues wake up every morning and go to work willing to risk your lives for the people that you serve. And this is an incredible example of just that. And I want you to know how proud we are as a council to have you and your colleagues in the city of Bellevue working for us and, and just to have your spirit and your courage and your compassion. We're very honored. Before I present the award, I'd like to invite, I know you have some special friends here with you, the Hawkins, from come all the way from Hawaii. If uh, we'd like to all gather here, I will present this award to you. Next up, we have the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve? I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have two study Hello sessions. There. Whoa. How can I help? <laughs> Let's see. What, what do we need help on? <laughs> That's a first. Um, we have two study session items, and Mr. Miyaki, would you like to introduce them? Thank you, Mayor. Um, the first one is an informational update on the Bellevue Downtown Association's partnership with the city's cultural um, and economic development staff, which um, they do to support the public space uh, management and activation in the downtown. The Bellevue Downtown Association will provide a report on the 22-23 public space management projects 
as well as an overview of how this work aligns with the strategic plan. Uh, joining us this evening are Anthony Gill, um, who is the Interim Grant Connection Program Manager with the Community Development Department. To his right, as you know, is Patrick Bannon, President of the Bellevue Downtown Association. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Anthony, to kick it off. Perfect. Thank you so much, City Manager Miyaki. Uh, so thank you so much for having us, Mayor Robinson and members of the Council. As City Manager Miyaki mentioned, tonight's presentation is an informational update from one of the city's uh, cultural and economic development team's key partners, the Bellevue Downtown Association. Over the past four years, CED has helped fund certain place management activities conducted by the BDA in order to encourage people to stay downtown longer and come back more often. This work aligns with our goal to support small business and retailers speed our recovery from the pandemic, and create new amenities as more people live and work downtown. This work on management and operations of public space is also essential to the Grand Connection vision to connect people and places from Maiden Bower Bay Park through downtown and across I-405 to East Trail. So Patrick Bannon, BDA's president, will be sharing an update on our ongoing place management and activation partnership, as well as their recently adopted strategic plan. I'm also here to answer any questions that you may have. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Patrick. Thank you, Anthony. Good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhaus, members of the council. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, and it is a privilege to be here tonight to talk about downtown, and even more importantly, the people uh, and the partnerships that make this downtown what it is today. The first slide really is all about an invitation, less a declaration, more an invitation to go boldly forward. And what I'd like to highlight tonight principally is that it is the spirit of partnership that allows us to go boldly forward. The work that has come before us, the decisions this council and prior councils have made that leaders uh, and residents throughout Bellevue have made over the last uh, you know, seven decades. So ultimately, um, there's a truth that I'd like to start out with, and that is that downtowns are intrinsically human places and that we are in it together. It's public and private and partnership every day and everything in between. And because people care so much about what happens in their city and downtown, both today and tomorrow, downtown should represent an array of opportunities. And we welcome the opportunities it brings. For nearly 50 years, almost 50, next February will be the BDA's 50th anniversary. Uh, this organization, a nonprofit membership organization, has been able to agree on at least one thing, and that is our mission and vision, which have both stayed amazingly consistent over time. And in our vision and our work together, it's less about a vision for the BDA as an organization. It is much more about a vision for downtown Bellevue. The downtown Bellevue is a vital, livable, accessible, and welcoming community. It is a creative center for global talent and innovative businesses. It is a thriving retail, dining, and entertainment destination. And it is a growing, diverse residential neighborhood and a supportive partner to surrounding neighborhoods and cities. It was the early 70s that the city's first planning director, Fred Herman, working with private sector leaders, decided to tr answer some questions, some questions about the direction of downtown. It wasn't so much revitalization need, it was more about a redevelopment opportunity, answering the question about what type of community, what type of downtown should Bellevue have. And that story keeps getting written every day. In our work, uh, over the last five years, we've seen significant change. Change has been a constant and this snapshot gives us one look at the changes we've seen. Over the last 12 months, we've been, we were able to, through a platform called Place for AI, track anonymized cell phone data. And this anonymized cell phone data is served up in a number of reports. So over the last 12 months, downtown itself, and when you think of downtown, we're using the traditional boundaries of, of what we know to be downtown, west of 405 and east of 100th. And uh, we've seen about 30, th almost 34 million visits over the last 12 months. That is up over calendar year 2022 by about 9%, uh, significantly up over 21 and 20, 
and still, by comparison, down from 2019. What these numbers show me is that downtown Bellevue overall has made a remarkably strong rebound from the pandemic, uh, from a time of significant change and that we continue to be, we see the trends move upward. We're still recovering. There are spaces to fill. We've had major tenant moves and the landscape continues to, involve, uh, to evolve. Downtown Bellevue, like the rest of the east side, experiences high cost to access, high cost to lease space, high cost to do business, high cost to, to rent space in, in downtown Bellevue and throughout the community. At the same time, given the recent development wave, we have seen more people-centered uh, places and experiences come online. Uh, we've celebrated the opening of, of uh, new buildings. We've seen our downtown parks receive significant investments and the continued decision-making and investments from this community is paying off dividends and helping people come back together and enjoy downtown Bellevue. We remain intensely focused on fundamentals. It's hard to whittle down a list of fundamentals to seven, but here are seven fundamentals that we track, we keep a close eye on, and ultimately informs the city partnership work that we move forward together. A downtown should have strong impact as an economic and cultural center for the city. It should, be, it should have creative density as a hub for talent, arts, and culture. We have a rich legacy in our community of being a thriving retail center. That retail has been a catalyst for residential growth, for office growth, for being an employment center for the entire region. We continue to see growth in the dining and hospitality sectors. Connectivity is of huge value to the community. Downtown Bellevue has made significant strides through its access to transit, more walkable streets and sidewalks, through vision and planning with the Grand Connection Project, and through making strategic key roadway capacity investments, uh, especially over the last two decades. People value their social spaces, the plazas, parks, and public places we all love, and hopefully love, and want to continue to improve. Downtown Bellevue is an 18-hour community, increasingly so, we pay close attention to its social fabric and diversity. We are a, a growing and diversifying community and our public places and our spaces are where we wanna celebrate that and continue to make the invitation to all. And then innovation and quality. Customer care, attention to detail. We see that take place in private spaces at Bellevue Square, in the downtown park, in Old Bellevue, in office buildings, at City Hall. We want to continue to monitor and extend that level of care and attention to detail to our public spaces. If there is an eighth one, it might be don't screw it up, right? We have a fairly good thing going, uh, but that seemed a little crude and seven are enough already. Highlighting the partnership programs and activities, especially over the last two years that we have invested in together uh, with the city. These should be familiar to you. We've celebrated them, we've noted them in the past. We've learned a lot from these experiences. Over the last two years, we've invested in and staffed downtown experience ambassadors that particularly over the summer have evaluated our public spaces, they've supported our community events, they've noted key trends, kept count of litter, kept count of other nuisances that we can uh, take care of. They were early on counting shopping carts, uh, so much so that they were tired of counting shopping carts and we were able to keep that conversation going and thanks to the city's investment, uh, have made some progress on that. Right before the pandemic, we invested in movable bistro furniture. It may seem like a small thing, but the act of putting out 24 uh, tables, uh, three chairs at each table, that are colorful and movable in public spaces in downtown along the Grand Connection route are an invitation for people to gather. They're the in invitation for people to enjoy one another's company and, and ultimately be in, in, uh, in the space with one another. We've found that, the, that this to be a tremendous success to have this furniture available for use. We've lost one chair in the last four years. Uh, everything has been right. It looks That's great it. in my patio. It, it, right. Well, thank you. Yeah. They. They. If you look underneath Mayor Robinson, it says "Property of Bellevue Downtown Association." Uh, you can bring it back. So, knock on wood, 
uh, we'll continue to, to have a good track record with the movable outdoor furniture. Again, a small thing, but something simple that can activate our spaces. We continue to work on opportunities to highlight the parking we have available in downtown. We do have an abundance of parking. We, it has been a competitive advantage to have available parking. And as we welcome more people to downtown and increasingly try to build business and build foot traffic in areas that traditionally haven't had parking, people are unsure where to go. Uh, people are unsure of what garages to use, what is paid, what is unpaid. So we're working collaborati collaboratively with the city to highlight pub public parking opportunities. And then connected primarily to the Grand Connection, we have implemented a pilot for wayfinding and interim signage to let people know where they are. And this is just a pilot and there's a significant opportunity moving forward for us to expand wayfinding and giving people the tools they need to navigate around downtown, especially on foot. Over the last three years, we've worked collaboratively on the Alfresco Outdoor Dining in Old Bellevue. We've expanded our Bellevue Beats and Bites music series to uh, different parts of the day, incorporating a pop-up market last year, this year incorporating a wine and beer garden that is open to all, uh, and doing other activations within our music presentation uh, to, again, extend the invitation to welcome uh, workers who are returning to the office, residents who are uh, growing in number in downtown Bellevue and really celebrate um, what we have talent-wise in our region and, uh, and to make each, each corner and sidewalk come alive uh, as best as we can. We've launched online resources through this collaboration for the workforce that's returning, including a restaurant guide, again, more parking information, shopping guide, uh, and, and the dining guide in particular has been of, of significant help. It takes staffing and, and a lot of uh, work to keep this updated, and it's uh, something we take seriously. And so if you see an update that's needed, feel free to reach out to me anytime. We're always trying to stay on our toes and keep our, our information updated. Right as the pandemic was happening, we quickly worked with the city team to decide what are, where can we have the most impact. There are resources coming together through pandemic relief funds. Uh, there are activities to directly help businesses to distribute PPE. One of the, the areas that we felt there was a gap and eventually a need was to help tell the story of our business community small businesses and organizations throughout downtown Bellevue that have a story to tell. Not just BDA members, but businesses of all kinds. Those who are coming up with creative and innovative ways to make, uh, keep their people on staff. They're bringing new products to our marketplace. And the Heart of Bellevue campaign is something that we continue to sustain and put a significant amount of time into. Joined tonight by my colleague, Sandy Vo. She's uh, in the back there. I don't know if Sandy, you can raise your hand, but she has single-handedly, working with our team, but been a primary uh, author of stories about the people behind the place in downtown. And people have been willing to share their stories. And again, highlight uh, not just the buildings and spaces we have, but really the energy, innovation, and creative talent that this community has. Uh, and we're building on a legacy of that every day. So with Heart of Bellevue campaign, there have been more than 80 person behind the place features, uh, hundreds of, well, 131 weekly newsletters, and uh, social media has, has gone through the roof for us uh, comparatively back, uh, compared to before we, went, we had our Heart of Bellevue campaign. Uh, more than a million uh, in audience across all social media. So it's, it's, again, work that takes time, effort, energy, and commitment, and this partnership has made it happen. We're excited about the future, and planning is a necessary tool, and we decided as an organization that we needed to update our strategic plan uh, just recently. I don't know if I recommend doing a strategic planning process during a pandemic, we were kind of on our way out of it. It was a unique, unique time to do it, but we felt it was ultimately necessary to reshape and define our trajectory moving forward as an organization. And what we found is that our city partnership work was already lining up well with the focus of our strategic plan and the input, input that community voices were providing. Not just the BDA board of directors or our membership, but our consulting partner, MIG, asked for 
uh, input across stakeholders in, in Bellevue. And what we heard, we try, again tried to summarize in the top four themes, is that people are concerned, excited, anxious about growth. They're highly interested in the quality of the downtown experience, the connections we make, especially of a multimodal nature, improving walkability, and ensuring people can get here from throughout the region, and then building community and celebrating uh, the diverse social fabric and tapestry that is Bellevue. So as you'll, if you've had an opportunity to uh, just breeze through the strategic plan, you're, you'll again see these themes emerge as a focus on major connectivity projects, including the Grand Connection and the vision that is laid out for connecting across 405 to East Rail and through downtown. People are highly interested in, active, in more activated, safe, and attractive community spaces. Private building owners and in places like parks that are well tended, um, those are pretty well taken care of. It's the spaces in between that do continue to matter. It's spaces where we want to answer the question, does someone care? Are they tending to uh, its safety, its attractiveness? Are there things we can do to activate it with art, with music, uh, with engagement opportunities? Doing work to activate spaces throughout downtown, the 410 acres that we have in downtown Bellevue, will take time, it will take energy, and it will take resources. Resources that today go beyond what the BDA's budget would allow. We have membership uh, dues, of course, like any organization uh, like ours. We have sponsorships and event revenue. And we have some city contract partnership work that helps extend transportation demand management as well as the city partnership work. But in order to do more public realm management and activation work, in order to deliver more of what we feel the community wants in the way of community celebrations, live music, public art, um, experiences that really represent our community, we're going to need more resources to get that done. And we've seen through our strategic planning process, property owners want to be supportive in that, in that work. I feel the city wants to be supportive in that work, and we certainly heard it from our residents at our recent mingle that they'd like to see more and be supportive in that work. Getting it done is the hard part. And so identifying additional resources is a part of my challenge and the BDA's challenge over the next year and a half. And then as our community continues to grow and diversify, rethinking event opportunities is a big opportunity for our community. Much more to say about that. We've done major community events over the last 20, 25 years, and we've done them well. But as we continue to grow and diversify, we want, to, we want downtown to be a stage for even more. Summarizing our, the objectives in our strategic plan, we have six core goals. And then if you look at the planning document, there are implementation steps outlined for each of the core goals. Reflecting the themes from our feedback, create safe and attractive spaces, celebrate community, really extend the invitation for people to celebrate in downtown in a number of ways. Continue to champion mobility. Uh, the city and community has made great strides in improving our multimodal network. People still want to have uh, options when they come downtown, whether they're coming by car, by bike, by transit, by scooter, you name the mode. Um, engaging with data-driven advocacy for organizations like ours and in order to represent downtown and uh, the brand that we have in order to maintain a competitive uh, advantage, we want to bring data-driven advocacy along with the city to represent our needs with you know, locally, regionally, and at other levels of, uh, of, of work, including federal government. We need to continue to support retail and their storefront economy, telling their stories, understanding their needs. We will consider, continue to see transition in the way of redevelopment and some displacement. We want businesses to have a place to go in downtown or within Bellevue. Our brokers on the retail side and the commercial leasing side have their work cut out for them. They are outstanding at what they do, yet there are still some opportunities and challenges, especially with the code, that we can look at to continue to make improvements so that businesses, uh, small, mid-size, even large businesses can stay here in downtown Bellevue. And then number six is enhance the BDA's capabilities. This comes back to resources, our team, 
our ability to scale with downtown's growth and meet rising expectations. We haven't had anyone come to us in the strategic planning process and say, you know, dial it back, do less. If anything, the invitation has been to do more and then to set realistic expectations about what we can do with what we have. And it's our responsibility to continue to inform that work with community insights, continue to ask what people value, and ultimately, if we're going to do more, we need to be very specific about the use of resources ahead of time and not uh, guess at it later. Wrapping up, we are facing a bright future. And just like when you're staring at any kind of bright light, you might put on your shades or lower the visor, or it might be at night and it's lighting a path, uh, there are a certain set of challenges before you can move boldly forward to face a bright future. And these challenges are informed by study tours we've taken to other communities, conversations and lessons learned from other downtown organizations, and of course, coming to city council meetings over the last 18 years, uh, I've learned a lot about challenges and what it takes to move forward uh, in, a, in, a, in a spirit of partnership. Complacently, complacency and lack of attention. We know, especially in the downtown, that problems can cost more to solve later. Understanding who's in charge and not so much of there's an authority in place, but it's more or less the responsibilities. Just like in a workplace, we need to understand the responsibilities of various organizations and who's going to take care of uh, the key needs we're facing. And then like any issue, entrenched sides can stay entrenched and nothing happens. Uh, finding common ground can become difficult. We can pull out examples from other communities in the past and currently where entrenched sides have led to complacency, a lack of clarity around responsibilities, and ultimately um, a strong need to recover uh, as opposed to move forward. Moving boldly forward and extending that invitation uh, through our, to our membership and through the community and to the city will take active collaboration, sharing of responsibilities, actionable steps for new initiatives, the details will matter significantly, and then ultimately we're on, it's a long game, the work of uh, downtown, the work that, uh, the investment that the city makes in a downtown, the rallying of stakeholders that a private organization puts forward is to hopefully set up enduring stewardship for a thriving downtown experience. Leaving you with a quote from an urbanist, socialist, a uh, socialist, I'm sorry, <laughs> a, uh, a social observer and, uh, and consultant from the past. Uh, he died in 1999, William Hawley White. And uh, he was one of the lead thinkers that led the project of public spaces. He uh, was an innovator in thinking about how people come together in social spaces, wrote several books. And uh, he visited downtown Bellevue in 1980 at the invitation of the Bellevue Downtown Association. And, and Holly White uh, had a, a quote that has stuck uh, not just for Bellevue, but for other communities. And that the thing that attracts other people is people. And then ultimately we want to an extend, extend an invitation to other people, a lot more people uh, to enjoy downtown. Bellevue welcomes the world and the world is coming. And the people who are coming are going to bring cars and noise and all of the idiosyncrasies that we all share as part of humanity, but they're also going to bring their wisdom, their talent, their creative creativity and their energy, and we want all of that downtown. Interesting quote from Holly White when he visited in 1980 from a, Sa a Seattle Post Intelligencer story. White said that downtown Bellevue needs streets and sidewalks and ground level retailers with street front windows to bring people back to the street. Although there are others that, are, that look at it and try to do that, they haven't been trying to coalesce into a dynamic city. In regard to Bellevue, White said, he never saw such an unusual city. Nancy Rising, executive director of the Bellevue Downtown Association, this, again, this is back in 1980, said that after, meeting, after the meeting that the current work on a new zoning code to an effort, it, as an effort to change a car-oriented suburb created in 1953 into a people-oriented city in the 90s. The work continues. Thank you again for your collaboration, your ongoing invitation to make downtown a thriving place. 
and uh, look forward to much more work together. Thank you, that was a wonderful presentation. I'm gonna start with Council Member Lee for comments or questions. Thank you, I wanna make a few comments. It's maybe just one question. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the wonderful presentation. You really articulated the history all the way through and the progress and the challenges and the future promises that we're looking at. Uh, I just want to make a couple of quick introductions first. Uh, <clears throat> I always say that the downtown Bellevue is the goose that lays the golden egg. So you can tell how much emphasis you know, I place, and I think most people, on downtown Bellevue. Uh, the challenge and the growth is in the old days, you know, when I first got on the council, uh, we mostly uh, still are uh, office daytime, you know, eight hours, and it's deserted when people go home. So it's now, you know, uh, because of the zoning, because of encouragement, and because, uh, you know, obviously downtown association, businesses, government all working together, it's now probably the largest neighborhood in the city. Uh, I think it's well over 10,000 people living here now. It's growing, right? I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's growing for sure. I think the target's like what? 15,000, 13,000? We have 15,000 currently, and that's a 400% Yes. growth over so the last 20 years. I remember the first resident, uh, residential places, uh, apartment, located built by Michael Christ. <laughs> and it's been a while before everything started going, and it's just amazing. So I want to compliment on the partnership, uh, because like you said, it's people that makes things happen. Uh, and I want to say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we look at your, your goal, you know, I, I want to comment on that. Uh, I agree with almost 100% all the goals, six goals you mentioned, core goals. But the two I mainly want to really emphasize is, uh, which I agree 100%, uh, let me look at this, create safe and attractive spaces, safety. Because when people live there, when people especially living there, they work there, obviously, they want to be safe. You know, we see our neighbors, you know, they have problems because it's not safe. So when people live there 24 hours a day, and the children, the family, it's got to be safe. And the other one is uh, uh, champion mobility. It's very important. You know, downtown, we have a lot more people. From zero population to 15,000, that's a lot of folks. You have to get them in and out. You mentioned Fred Herman. You know, his vision was still actually completing it. One of the things you talk about is accessibility, how to get in and out of downtown. You talk about uh, underground traffic, transportation. We have it now. We have light rail coming in underground. So there's other things we can do. And all the uh, pedestrian corridor you talk about, it's all very important. It's all part of the mobility right, improvement that we can make people, if people get stuck in somewhere, they're gonna come, they're gonna go, right? Uh, the council member yeah. leak. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm done, well. Okay. It's can a we lot. just tighten it up a little? <laughs> okay, so I'm glad you're developing the strategy plan, very much so. But one thing you mentioned, however, is partnerships, so you have to, we have to coordinate and uh, be consistent and compatible with the city's goal and vision. So I think it's important which I think you have done very well, but I would encourage, because there's so many changes happening, so many more challenges happening, so many things, we have diversity, lots of people with different ideas, different visions, and different cultures, so I think it's important that we have to work closer against people. So my, my question then is, uh, given the changing nature of work, you know, the, the, uh, because of the, the pandemic, uh, the work, uh, new new norm, you know, we have office empty now, you know, and uh, they have to figure out how to occupy the space. And then we also have, uh, uh, obviously, the uh, uh, economy, you know, it's going to be stagnant for a while, don't know how it's going to recover. So how do you, as BDA, what would you think, what your plan of pivoting on working toward those 
hopefully temporary problems and make it work and for the city in the very near future. I, key, key point you just said was hopefully temporary, but it may be a longer term issue that we face with vacant space or how best to utilize space. The fundamentals in downtown Bellevue are exceedingly strong and that works in our favor to fill space. Fortunately, the blocks of office space that we'll see come available or that have come available are in class A buildings, class A plus buildings, however you want to classify them. And that's going to create opportunities for new businesses, businesses that may have wanted to be in our market to, to check out Bellevue. And I know our brokerage community is working hard on, on those future tenants. We also can do it an even stronger uh, job in telling the story of Bellevue, representing it not just regionally, but looking at opportunities across, uh, across the country and even globally. And that means continued partnership with Visit Bellevue, with our Chamber of Commerce, with other organizations, cultural and community development related to say what are the, your fundamentals and how do we best express those to future tenants. Paying attention to the details and those in those in-between spaces are going to make a difference. And our transportation network is going to be an advantage too. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilmember Barksdale. All right, thank you. Uh, Patrick, good to see you. Thanks for the, the presentation. Um, so first gonna react to the last comment you made around um, trying to make, working to make it easier for mom and pop shops. I'm gonna translate a little bit. Uh, for mom and pop shop um, entrepreneurs to move into or enter into the market in Bellevue. So I'm really excited to hear about that work and look forward to it. In your plan, you had um, creating a DEI framework, which I'm excited about. And I think it, um, I'm curious how, that, how you see that integrating in, given the plan is created you know, for 2023 and beyond. How are you seeing, <clears throat> seeing that work tie into the strategic plan as you're carrying it out, right? I mean, we're continually, continuing to diversify and so forth, wanting to see the increase representation, right? And so just curious about how you're going to do that. And then I'm going to put a plug in for more night activities, mm -hmm. <laughs> just in general. Um, positive so, night activities. Positive? Is yeah. that what you meant? Oh, yeah. Just more, more night events? More night events, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, uh, on the... Wayfinding, are you looking at, and I, I, hear, I hear you on capacity, are you looking at a digital wayfinding approach? I think there could be some opportunities there to provide suggested routes through the downtown area for folks who are maybe starting at one point and then, you know, looking for that, um, what's, in, what's around them, but then suggesting trails throughout downtown based on maybe the kind of experience they're looking to have in the city. Yeah, thank you. On DE&I framework, that touches a topic that, when I look back, there there's some, if we could go back and play it again, we'd do things differently on our strategic plan. And it wasn't a fault of the strategic plan in, you know, in principle, but really we should have developed our DE&I framework as we were doing our strategic planning process. I would have liked to have done that work concurrently or right before then. However, it is a very much a work in progress currently as we evaluate our event portfolio or our board representation, invitations we make to the community. When we talk about placemaking, which can mean different things to different people, it really should be informed by the users of the place and the organizations and the, and the residents that are, are populating that space. We have a lot of work to do in order to uh, understand how best to make the invitation and then convene in a way that is meaningful and, and provides value. Thank okay. you, and i um, glad to hear it. I mean, I, I, I think it's important that you're prioritizing it, so I hear you on the, on the past not being able to incorporate, but I appreciate the work that you're doing to incorporate it now. QR code? Uh, digital wayfinding, any yeah. thoughts about where that's there, at? There are several tools and, and potential uh, options that we can explore with digital wayfinding. I mean, from very simple things like the QR code you'll see on the temporary wayfinding for the Grand Connection to installed wayfinding appliances that are interactive and digital. Those are high cost and yeah. take a significant investment, but it's worth exploring. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the work that you all did. Thank you. Downtown. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Patrick, for the great presentation, great update, um, and thank you for the socialist quotes. I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> Always. Um, as well as you, <laughs> um, you um, I'm just going to jump around a little bit. You made a lot of, uh, uh, of great points. Like you know, on the on the on the parking, um, uh, it, it feels as if 
when there is con uh, when there's concern or confusion on parking, just giving you some unsolicited feedback that I always hear all the time. Thank you. Um, is not necessarily they know where to park when they're going to Bell Square or Lincoln Tower South, etc. When I hear the confusion or they're un unsure about where to park is when they really want to go to Main Street and they're not sure where to go then. So I, I'm sure that's a, a priority for you. Um, uh, but uh, that's that's where I hear the because other than that, I never really hear that often about you know parking issues. Um, and you're right, it is a competitive advantage that we currently have, except for that one part of downtown. I feel when people desperately want to um, visit one of our uh, wonderful mom and pop shops there or restaurants or bars or or, or, or what have you so we'd, we'd love to hear what you're what you're doing there as I continue down and then you can you can answer them um, love the fact that you're rethinking the event um, opportunities for the city uh, both in terms of the uh, diversity of events as well as the scale of the events um, you know I think we've proved that we can put on some world-class events in this city and uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're rethinking that so thank you for including that in that strategic plan um, safety like Councilmember Lee just mentioned if we don't have safety uh, I think everything else falls apart very, very quickly. So I appreciate the fact that you have uh, uh, really emphasized that and the importance of that, as well as balancing that. I think, you know, in order to put on an event safely, you know, that takes resources and, 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 and there are times when maybe we should step away, but identifying the ones that we can do, do it right and do it safely, those are the ones that uh, we, sh we, we should target. So I appreciate, again, your, your emphasis on that. Um, question uh, on two items that you had in here. One was under the uh, unclear responsibilities. Um, I'm just clear, kind of curious about that under the challenges. I would like to learn a little bit more about that, where that uncertainty lies in terms of who's responsible for what or what you're seeing right now, and also what maybe we as a city could help um, uh, clarify what the responsibilities are. Or maybe that's on a case-by-case -case basis, but I would love to get your insight on that. Um, and then also you mentioned about um, keeping downtown competitive. Um, you That might have been a catch-all for everything, but I'd love to get a little more insight from you on that. I mean, does that mean the, the quality and breadth of shopping and dining and events, et cetera, or does it go beyond that in terms of us being competitive? Those are the, the two questions that uh, we'd love to get a little further insight on. But thank you so much for a great presentation, great great update to all the great work that the BDA is doing year round. And I really appreciate all the wonderful partnerships that you have, not only with the city, but with all the major employers as well, doing sterling work. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll start with parking. I think you raised that just briefly. This is an ongoing project that's part of the collaboration where it's basic inventory of available spaces, paid or unpaid, geographically where are they located? Is it available during the day, in the night? And then finding the best way or tool to package the information and then market what's available and then monitor its use to not that we're out there monitoring parking utilization, but monitor the effectiveness of it. We have available parking and it's consolidated and marketed through apps on third party uh, platforms, but we think there's an opportunity based on what we've learned in other communities to do a better job consolidating and marketing the, the parking that is available. Uh, on the res shared responsibilities, Exactly, and I say exactly because the experience of the Grand Connection and understanding the legacy of decisions that were made through private with private development as part of permitting, public agencies, the transit center, um, light poles, you name it, there, is a, there are a number of elements in the public realm that even in deeper conversations about who's responsible for what, leads to, I'm not quite sure, let's get, we'll come back to that. Patchwork. Right, it is a patchwork. And so this is happening in large part thanks to the leadership and initiative of the city staff team working with the BDA to use the Grand Connection as a great example of who's responsible for what, and it goes deep. So that's uh, important work. That was one of the primary elements there. And even on bigger topics like keep keep downtown competitive. Of course, we all want to keep downtown competitive, but what does that mean? I think it is understanding um, what our vision is. Is our vision shared and are we 
uh, clear in what we want to try to accomplish as a community, and then continually communicating and keeping the conversation moving forward, paying attention to the details, not becoming complacent and saying, are we where we want to be or are there some other problems we want to solve together? So when I, when I think of keep downtown competitive, there are various metrics we can look at, but it, it really is that ongoing collaboration and communication at where we're answering the question, are we competitive and are we uh, fulfilling our vision? Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Zahn. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I, I love this presentation and the partnership. Um, what you said about spirit of partnership to go boldly forward, absolutely. <clears throat> the fact that this is about um, being human-centered places and also celebrating community because I was reminded when you, we talked about 15,000 in downtown that this is literally the living room of folks living in downtown. And so just being cognizant of that, um, I love the fact that you leaned in and pivoted to the Pride Dog Walk right, as part of downtown, and so that will keep moving and be even uh, a larger event, which I think um, the community really has embraced and look forward to. Um, I, I would say that I would like to see even more activating spaces and pop-ups and human-centered spaces. I don't know, portable pianos with games in addition to music, and so I, I know that coming into the winter, it may be a little more challenging to think of what um, types of events we could still have potentially outside. And then um, when you talked about um, the partnerships, I was actually thinking about Bellhop and how that potentially helps activate the mobility and getting people around. And I would say um, safety to me in downtown is also about making sure that people can walk around safely because there are sometimes still cars that drive pretty fast in downtown, and I do worry about the, the safety of pedestrians walking around. So as we look at that, um, we haven't quite mentioned curb management plan, but I think when we talk about parking and, and mobility, um, how we best look at some of the tools that is in the curb management to, to be in partnership with BDA, um, I really like the idea of the wayfinding and the parking and, and leveraging smart data so that people can make the, the decision about where to park, hopefully before they even get there, so they're not looping around a bunch of times looking for parking and creating um, both congestion as well as frustration and trying to find a place to park. I had heard that it, we had mapped the inventory of parking, and there's actually a lot of parking in downtown, but it may be... Um, not as well understood about parking that's inside buildings and, and what's accessible. So I appreciate you um, taking a look and doing that work. Uh, the question about the, the small businesses and the commercial rents, and I appreciate the fact that, thank you, Sandy, for telling their stories. Um, I would like to figure out how in partnership we can do more with the displacements of these businesses and is there more we can do with supporting tenant spaces that maybe is too big for a small business and the rents are pretty high? Are there some shared uses or some currently vacant spaces that could potentially be a temporary pop-up and what could be done in partnership to make that work more? And um, you mentioned in there about more revenue and funding. So I guess I'm kind of curious about what that might look like and is some of that potentially business partners? Uh, we now have a TPA with some funds for Visit Bellevue. Is that potentially a, a funding source as well for some shared common um, or, or shared projects or programs that you're thinking about? Um, related to DEI, I'm also very interested in that. I'm wondering if there's more that we could do with an organization like Intentionalist who has mm -hmm you know, leaned in in other cities, um, some of the smaller BIPOC uh, retail and restaurants, and, and they've actually worked with the different sports teams to, to promote and activate. I haven't seen that necessarily in Bellevue, so I'm curious to see if we could do something there. And then lastly, related to the shared responsibility, I guess my thinking there is, you know, I always lean into 
um, responsibility being to the folks that are the most um, knowledgeable or um, the best to manage whatever that particular item is. So as we look at that shared responsibility and clarity, hopefully we are really looking at how best to um, activate and leverage the best of all of the partners that we can bring. Um, all in all, though, super excited about uh, the continued partnership and, and even more of the type of things to come. So, Thank you, Council Member Zahn. Just briefly, uh, you're right. Uh, it is apparent to me many, many times before getting into what does it take to, to do strong retail recruitment and handle the work around the constraints we have, uh, understand the needs of small businesses, what is viable for them. Expertise only goes so far here and within even our, our 10 person team, we need to continue to look for resources, many of whom are in our community, outside resources if needed to to really keep that conversation well informed so that we're, we're not guessing, we are applying data-driven approaches uh, that are, are relevant to our community. On funding options, um, most downtown organizations, uh, a strong percentage of North American downtown organizations have a component called a business improvement district or a business improvement area. The BDA has been around for almost 50 years, like I said. We have been you know, vigorously membership driven and making excellent use of the resources we've had available to us and looking creatively and entrepreneurially at ways to do that. Ultimately, based on feedback and interest from stakeholders um, throughout downtown, we feel the, the expectations will continue to rise for the downtown experience and that the interest level in specific activities and enhanced services will, will become necessary, where, where city services and investments hit a certain level and that the expectations and interest in doing more, activating more, taking even better care of our public spaces becomes an interest and a focus for our, our business community, our property owners. But that is a, a, it's a challenging conversation because anytime we're talking about revenue, it's who pays, how much, is it fair, and uh, what do we get for it? And so that value proposition conversation is one that we want to have over the next year, year and a half, so that we are informing that work with the stakeholders, potential rate payers or public-private partners who are helping us get that work done so that they're, they're feeling highly invested in the outcomes. And again, it's not a guess at what we hope might work. It's, it's based on, on the data and the interests of those who would be paying into that partnership. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Council Member Stokes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, what's been said so far is, is really amazing. And, and I think uh, good questions and all. Uh, I, I just can't say, anything too too much about BDA uh, and it's just been a, a pleasure seeing it grow and how it develops and uh, it's it's uh, clearly has made as a big part of making Bellevue what it is and making Bellevue as, as vibrant as it is uh, you know one of the things I like about it too um, is that BDA has a positive effect on not just downtown, but other parts of Bellevue. Uh, it's, you're not just downtown. Uh, and that's why, just call it BDA, it's kind of more in inclusive, but it really, I think, has a, a great ripple effect for the rest of the city. And people from the community come, uh, and neighborhoods like to come into downtown. Uh, so you've just been an amazing part of that. The other is, uh, you know, obviously working with uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I don't, I haven't seen, uh, lived in a lot of cities and been around. I haven't seen the, co the collaboration as, as strong as this in, in many places. And it's, it's increased um, so much under your leadership also. And uh, that, that, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, other, other things we have is, is a list. I have five things here. One is parks. We have parks, little parks, big parks, parks on the lake, all these different things. That is really mixed down and it's downtown and people can come and have a big park downtown and it's really great the other the arts which is increasing and having arts in the parks having arts other places and the art uh, events you have uh, year-round just makes it a vibrant vibrant city 
uh, again, we would be lost without that. You'd have to create some whole, whole new um, uh, organization, and it probably wouldn't be as good. Um, and the other are the trails. Yes, the downtown, the uh, Grand Connection is the big piece, and I'm really excited about getting that finally down and over and connecting to the east side, and it's connecting downtown with the other parts, which will have great effect. Uh, and although it's kind of on the other side, uh, East Rail is a big part of that too, because it connects in there. It, and it lets people come, and when it's done right, which we're working on, we'll be able to have people coming there and over to downtown. So that's, that's another part. And uh, then is the, uh, the, the community, the businesses, the smaller, larger businesses around all over town, and it's growing and growing again. And that's something you've really, you set the stage for people to be able to have businesses. And you make it very viable and, and, and really exciting about that. It's another piece of it. And then the last thing uh, is uh, the, uh, uh, it's the downtown, it's the businesses, it's the commerce, and it's the growth of downtown itself from a small, I can't, you know, coming here in 1991, and you see maybe it's a two-story building around somewhere all the things were small downtown. Uh, Bell Square was there, what, a couple, three stories maybe. And all of a sudden, downtown, and, and going through the downtown livability piece, and you were very, very helpful in that. And that's interesting because you're, you're again, you're, you're looking at how the growth should happen as well, and you're contributing that with all this other background. And so what has happened is we have this, with the downtown livability and the things that are going on, it's a tremendous downtown. It's, a, it's gotten uh, Amazon and others uh, to come here, smaller businesses, um, and it all ties together. And um, all of these other pieces fit into that. So you've done something that's very, very difficult to have so many positive working together pieces that make a whole. And I think that's... You've been a, the organization and the individuals working in it and working with the city and the, and the partnership with, with our staff, the partnership with the city, partnership with us is also just amazing. And I think that's why we're, uh, why Bellevue is, is what it is. Um, and you, I know you're very proud of it, but you should be. Thank um, you, Council Members. Thank you. Okay, yeah. well, you've heard it all. And uh, I'm just a big fan, as you know love what you've been doing and really looking forward to continuing our work with you thank you thank you for coming down tonight thank you okay with that we will take a quick break and come back at 20 till all right we're down to our second study session item mr miyaki would you like to introduce it Member, uh, the last study session topic this evening is uh, uh, a discussion on the emergency water supply master plan. Uh, just by way of background, this plan provides information on the vulnerability of the city's uh, water system in the event of a major earthquake and includes recommended policies uh, as well as actions to mitigate the impacts uh, to the city's water system if such an event were to occur. Um, following the presentation this evening, um, the, we, the staff will be seeking council consideration to finalize a resolution to adopt the, the plan as you see it tonight. Joining us at the table is Lucy Liu, our director, Linda DeBolt, assistant manager over engineering, and Eric LaFrance, uh, planning manager, we had to make sure you're there, Eric, all from the utilities department. We're also joined by Ken Wan, the vice chair of our environmental services commission. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Lucy. Good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor, New and Housing Council members. Uh, we are delighted to bring before you for consideration tonight a plan that will increase the resiliency of Bellevue's water supply by mitigating the risks associated with a major earthquake on our water system. Um, tonight, after the staff's presentation, uh, Vice Chair Wan will provide the Commission's recommendation on the plan. Um, so tonight, we are seeking your direction on adoption of the Emergency Water Supply Master Plan. And if directed, we will bring the plan back at a, a future council member uh, meeting for adoption. So utilities have been working on this important planning effort for the past five years. The plan uh, proposes to take actions that will increase the resiliency of Bellevue's water system. The proposed investments make financial sense 
and will result in a water system that provides a level of service that is more closely aligned with what our customers' uh, expectations are following a major uh, disruption from an earthquake. Now, planning for infrastructure resiliency is not new for Bellevue Utilities. This is part of our ongoing capital infrastructure renewal and replacement planning that we do. This plan adds a seismic resilience lens uh, to our long-term planning efforts. Um, so why are we seeking your adoption of this plan? Uh, this plan will be a supplement to the city's water system plan, and so uh, council adoption is required by city code. Uh, additionally, adoption of a post-earthquake level of service goal is required by state law. Uh, this plan includes new policies the, to guide the prioritization in restoring water service should an emergency disrupt the delivery of water to our customers. This plan also guides future capital investments. And formal adoption of the plan will enhance the potential for Bellevue to secure grants uh, for system resiliency efforts in the uh, future. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric uh, to highlight the proposed plan in more detail. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Council. Uh, here's a look at our agenda tonight. We're gonna start off by talking about why did we do this plan? We're gonna cover some of the key elements of the plan. We'll go over some of the staff recommendations and the ESC recommendations, and then we'll be looking to you for some guidance on moving forward. So in 2016, when we completed our water system plan, we identified the need to increase the uh, resiliency of our water supply. We looked at the hazards that our water supply faces and quickly identified an earthquake as the largest hazard. With our current infrastructure in the ground, if we were to experience a large earthquake, we would have two to three months of service disruption before we could restore water to all of our customers. This emergency plan seeks to increase the resiliency of our system. How would an earthquake affect our ability to deliver water to our customers? Well, there's two main ways. The first is the regional supply gets interrupted. Seattle Public uh, SPU or Cascade Water Alliance is unable to deliver water to us. So we had to look for ways, how could we source water locally? So we did an emergency well evaluation to see if we could drill wells and supply our own water. The second way our service could get interrupted is our local distribution mains, our system that we own and operate to get to the customers. To look at the, the uh, vulnerabilities of that, we conducted a seismic vulnerability and assessment and resiliency plan. We then wrapped both of those studies into the emergency water supply master plan. That master plan was then, uh, the development and the completion of that plan was taken through ESC in nine different working meetings over the five years. And now we're here before you. I'm not gonna go over all these milestones, but this is to highlight the fact that this has been a five-year journey, and it's been a journey that we've been taking with the ESC the whole time. In the next couple slides, we're gonna review some of the key plan components. As Lucy mentioned, state law requires that we identify a post-event level of service goal. We will look at some of the recommendations that we're gonna be making, some of the investments. And as a preview, if you look at this picture, this is the end of an earthquake resilient water supply main. Now you notice that looks a lot different than the normal end of a pipe. All that structure is meant to increase the resiliency in an earthquake and allow that junction to flex without breaking. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the master plan is simple. It's to increase, in, increase the resiliency of our water supply. We do this by identifying ways in which our system can fail, and we figure out how do we prevent that future failure. <clears throat> we, also need, we also need to work with the public to increase their knowledge about the, ability, or the need to uh, supply themselves with water for at least 14 days in the event of a large service interruption. This plan documents our policies and uh, capital recommendations. It's a simply a water system plan for major emergencies. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, earthquakes and what could that look like here in Bellevue. Well, it turns out there's two types of earthquakes we could experience. 
There's the one you're probably most familiar with, the Cascade event. That is centered off the coast of Washington, and it's a subduction zone event, and sometimes referred to as the big one. But it turns out there's a type of earthquake that's centered closer to home that could be more damaging to our system. This figure depicts the Seattle Fault Zone. Those dashed pink lines roughly follow I-90. And it turns out that even though the earthquake on this fault line is not going to be as powerful, it is going to be more damaging to our system. Because like the picture that, we, that you saw earlier for a moment, the streets, this is a thrust fault. So instead of just waving like the Cascadia is going to make the land be very wavy, this is going to have the opportunity to have the land displace. And that's going to shear, has the potential to shear our mains and cause a lot more breaks. So let's look at these two different types of earthquakes and what we could expect. First, let's look at the Cascadia subduction zone quake. These happen about once every 500 years. We used earthquake data from around the world to model how would our system respond to this type of quake. The answer was over 200 breaks are predicted. This was going to take us over two months to restore service. This is going to result in about $2.3 billion of forecasted economic damage. If we take the economic damage and we divide by the chance it could happen, one in 500, we can annualize this risk, and this risk is about $4.6 million a year, just from the Cascadia zone. So let's look at the Seattle Fault. This happens a lot less often, once in 1,600 years, but it's going to result in over 500 breaks in a three-month recovery period. It's going to be almost $8.5 billion in economic damage, and when we annualize that risk, it's over $5 million a year. Both of these risks added together, the city is currently experiencing $9.8 million a year of risk from earthquakes. Next, we will look at some of our proposed policies. So now that we know the risks or how bad it can get, what level of mitigation is appropriate? That's where setting our post-earthquake level of service goal comes in. Once we have that level of service goal, we can identify what emergency mitigation investments we need to make. This will include developing some new groundwater sources. That will help mitigate the, the cutoff from the regional supply. And this also is important for us, and I, I point this out again, to encourage the public to prepare for a large outage with at least 14 days of water. And of course, we have to coordinate with our other non-governmental utilities that provide services for our customers. So we've identified a goal and we have some list of activities, but how fast should we try to accomplish all of these? So we looked at three different timelines. The first one was pretty aggressive. We looked at trying to complete all of our mitigation activities within 20 years. We found this one is probably unaffordable and maybe unattainable, not just due to our resources internally, but external resources, actually having the number of contractors in the market to do the work. So then we said, all right, well, let's look at another timeline. And this one, we said, all right, we're doing really good work right now with our renewal and replacement program on our aging water mains. What if we just continue to do that work, and as we replace those water mains, they become more resilient, the new materials are better than the old materials, but when we look at this uh, as a timeline, it takes over 100 years, and we don't feel that uh, it addresses the risk that we're facing appropriately. So then we took a risk-based risk approach of about 50 years, targeting our highest risk things first. And we looked at that, and that is our preferred option. That's the option that we're recommending. And then it's also about a similar timeline that we're finding that other agencies are taking. Sorry. Am I missing a slide? <clears throat> okay. All right. So let's, um, let's look at what we're proposing as mitigation activities. To increase the, re the resiliency of local supply, we're, gonna, we're going to encourage our regional supplier to become more resilient. And we may even partner with them on some projects but we also want to have a backup plan, and that's where the emergency wells come in. 
Once we get the water into the city system, we want to create a resilient backbone of earthquake resistant water mains. This backbone is going to connect key points of supplies and our critical customers. And then once again, we want to continue the good work we're doing right now with the, uh, the renewal and replacement program for our aging water, water mains. But one of the things we want to add to the prioritization of how we select the water mains that we want to replace is we want to put an earthquake resilience factor in that computation about how do we select the pipes. So if we use the 50-year uh, service goal and we do all the improvements on the schedules that we're proposing, you can see here that in 2020, that's when the resiliency study was done, that's why it's a couple years old now, uh, two to three months was our expected outage. By 2035, we can reduce that to one to two months if we continue to invest. By 2050, that's one to four weeks. And by 2070, the end of the 50-year target, we're down to one to 21 days, but most importantly, our critical customers are down to one to seven days without water. Those are places like hospitals and recovery centers. In this table, we're just kind of summing up what I, I already told you that in 2020, we're currently experiencing about $9.8 million of annual risk. If we make the investments that we're proposing, by the end of the period, 2070, we'll have reduced that risk to an annualized risk of only half a million dollars. The benefit to our customers would be $9.3 million a year in reduced risk. That's a reduction of 95%. So this slide is telling us a lot, so I'm gonna take some time to make sure we understand what it's telling us. The slide is a, a slide of the cumulative spending of our investments between year zero and year 50. Along the bottom of the graph is the time, and along the vertical axis are our cumulative investments in millions of dollars. Now the good news is that the orange represents our current planned R&R program. Those are investments we've, we're already planning to make. The city's count, the, the council's vision uh, has helped us establish that healthy R&R program. And you can see that that R&R is the majority of the investments. The only new proposed spending is that slice of the blue on top. And the total amount of that proposed investments is $125 million over the 50 year period. That new spending will be focused on the emergency supply wells and establishing that backbone of earthquake resilience water main. I have worked for multiple utilities in my career. And I can share with you that in my experience, Bellevue is unique in its long-term financial forecasting. This allows for Bellevue to take care of things like replacing our system and planning for earthquakes in the most fiscally responsible way with the least impact on our customers. So we are proposing new spending. Does it make sense to spend this money from the customer's point of view? We're looking at three different time horizons, 15, 30, and 50 years, and you can see that the seismic benefit, the reduction in risk that we receive for the new spending that we're proposing is always above one, which means it is a positive benefit versus cost relationship. And I'll remind you that new spending is for those backbone water supply and the new wells. Public engagement was a very important part of developing this plan. We received over 1,000 surveys back from the 5,000 solicited. 20% return rate is pretty good, but we weren't satisfied. We reached out and interviewed all the critical customers that we could identify and asked them what their emergency water supply plan was and what did they expect from us. Then we reached out to over 20 community-based organizations like Hopelink, asking them the same questions. What are you going to do and what do you need from us or what are you expecting from us? We learned a lot from the survey. We learned that there's very strong uh, support for doing this work. Over 77% of the survey respondents said it is very important for us to plan for this. They also, the surveyors also supported our decision to prioritize getting the critical customers up and going again first. 
But one of the things we did learn from the survey is that we have a lot of work to do when it comes to working with the public and educating them on how much water they need in case of an emergency. Less than 10% of the respondents currently are planning for a 14-day uh, emergency water supply. And with that, I'll hand it back to Lucy. Great. Thank you, Eric. So in summary, if we implement this plan and we will reduce the risk of economic damage to our community from water outage by 95%, as Eric uh, indicated earlier. This will reduce the water service disruptions from three months to just days. Um, that is the value of this plan. And so based on our assessment and the support that we heard from the community for resiliency planning, uh, our recommendation is to adopt the Emergency Water Supply Master Plan. And so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Vice Chair Juan to provide uh, the input from the Environmental Services Commission. Thank you, Lucy. Is this on? Do it, we can hear you. Think it's on. You can hear? Yep. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Neubenhaus, and City Council members. As you know, this Environmental Services Commission's charge is to review and provide input on short and long-term planning and policy development for the Utilities Department. The Commission has worked with the utility staff since 2018 to review and shape the development of the Emergency Water Supply Master Plan. The Commission held nine working sessions over the past five years, including sessions on the purpose of the Master Plan, earthquake hazards in the Pacific Northwest, and strategies to responsibly address the risks and impacts of a major earthquake to the city of Bellevue. The Commission endorses the proposed policies and post-earthquake service level goals in the Master Plan. These policies and goals are important for driving the Utilities Department's actions for earthquake mitigation and response. Some of the key elements of the plan that the Environmental Services Commission especially finds important include prioritizing water service restoration to customers that serve immediate life safety and community recovery functions. Those are the ones that Eric mentioned, such as hospitals and recovery centers. We also find important the investing in water system improvements to meet established earthquake mitigation goals. And lastly, conducting outreach and education to residents and businesses on how to prepare for water service interruptions in the event of a major earthquake. In conclusion, the Commission believes that the recommendations in the master plan are responsive to the risks of a major earthquake to our community. And they are both attainable and worth the investments within the time frames described in the plan, which is 50 years. Um, Therefore, it's the Commission's recommendation well, endorsing this master plan and recommends that the Council adapt the plan. Thank you. Um, so at this time, we'll answer any questions you have for us. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Wan, thank you so much for being here tonight. I just wanted to clarify, what was the vote on the Commission on this plan? It was a unanimous vote. Terrific. Thank you. Councilmember Lee, you are the liaison to this commission. Would you like to start us off? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, be a liaison from the City Council to Environmental Services Commission. As the Council liaison, I have worked closely with the commission in reviewing the Emergency Water Supply Master Plan and recommendation. I strongly support the recommendation of staff and the commission. The plan al aligns with the groundwork our council put in place in 1995 with the capital infrastructure renewal and replacement program. This is unique, as you mentioned. <laughs> I want to just point it out. We had the foresight, uh, forethought back then to ensure we are investing in our infrastructure resiliency. The common element in the presentation by staff is that a natural disaster may threaten our ability to deliver safe and reliable drinking water. Access to clean and safe drinking water is vital for the health and safety of our community in the event of a natural disaster. 
Our city relies on water for critical functions and services, including firefighting, hospitals, sanitation, and essential businesses. Thank you to the city's staff and Environmental Services Commission for the time you have put into developing this plan and ensuring we have a plan to mitigate the impact of a major earthquake and better recover the water service our community counts on. So I fully support your recommendation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Council Member Stokes. Yeah, uh, very, very good report and work done on this. Um, it, the question I think people will have, and just in general public and even think about it here, is uh, it's really great to have this plan in place. Uh, uh, 50 years is a long time, and what happens in the, in the meantime? If 10 years from now something happens, uh, how do we, I, I guess this is based on, you must have pretty good data that indicate that something like this is off in the future uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, we never know exactly, but so we, I know we, we have something built into that plan. Uh, so it's not, it's not deemed urgent right now in the next 10 years, hopefully. And the 50 years seems like, uh, a, you know, a time period that is rational. And part of it is just the cost and how to get it in place and time and all that. So it's, you have to get a, you're looking for the sweet spot on it, basically. It sounds like you've done that. Uh, is there, if on the very, very small chance that something happens before that time, before, when it's not, we, you're going to be doing things as you go along, so it's 50 years, so there'd be a lot of things in place. Mm -hmm. And I assume that you're looking at the more vulnerable pieces first and all that. And I think that's important to, for the community to know that this is, we're not just saying, okay, we'll do something in 50 years. We're going to work so that by 50 years, we will have it, all these pieces in place. Because it's, I don't think people realize how, <laughs> and I've seen those charts and everything, how, um, how this, um, how, how much, infrastructure is and where it is and all that. And we know from some current events that have happened when water, um, all that breaks, the water line breaks and all this, a lot of problems. Uh, so I, I really appreciate the work you've done and I, you know, was liaison for the commission at one, at, uh, one year or for two years and working with, of course, Cascade Water Alliance on similar things. And uh, it's just uh, very, very good work and uh, appreciate both the the Commission's uh, support on that uh, and the work you've done on that and looking forward to uh, getting it in place. And the sooner the better. Thank you, thank Councilmember you. Stokes. Councilmember Zahn. Yes, thank you. Um, I too um, appreciate and applaud your work at five years of persistence to get to this point. Because when we think about it, water is life. We can't survive without water. And so being able to be thoughtful about mitigating hazards is really prudent governance. And so getting this system resiliency done is, is really important. Um, a couple things I was thinking about, and that is, uh, you brought this up earlier, I don't know how many people in our community realizes they need 14 days of water um, in case of an emergency. So perhaps that is um, some outreach and awareness and education that could be done. And through to our community as well as maybe through our school district, um, through the kids and them learning as well. Um, appreciate the fact that you're prioritizing the more critical infrastructure first and that we're using the 50 year horizon for this because that's best practice from other cities as well to right size the not 20, not 100, but somewhere in between. Um, on the expected outage, you know, I started thinking about the fact that if we actually had an earthquake in our area, the two to three months actually may be um, optimistic because everyone else will be trying to find those same resources to uh, repair their water mains. So I really appreciate getting this done. I was looking at slide 19 that shows the new spending in blue and the existing R&R &R in orange. And it looks like we're not, we're, we're gonna be slowly increasing the new funding, and then as we get into the uh, outer years, a lot more funding that's going to be needed. So as, as we think about our risk tolerance, I guess my question would be, 
Um, I believe that right now all of the the utility spending is we we don't uh, take on any debt in order to pay for that, so it's all cash on hand, I guess. And my question might be that if this is something that is a risk mitigation, we might want to just talk about uh, the funding options for the CIP investments and if we are comparing increasing utility rates versus looking at whether some of the projects we, we might actually want to have a conversation around um, actually using only cash or um, many of our other projects actually have a CIP that's that's funded through you know um, other other means so just something to, to think about um, really excited that we got this in place and happy to vote and support thank you Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Eric, and uh, Vice Chair Wong and uh, Lucy. I've, I'm so thrilled that you're taking over this uh, such a well-run uh, department and following up uh, the great example that Nav had for so many years as leading this department. So great, great presentation. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, as, as you've noted, fully in line with uh, council priorities um, and uh, really in line with our, our view of resiliency. Um, so I, too, am very much in support of this. I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, number one, I think, Eric, you mentioned about uh, the prioritizing of the highest risks. Um, just curious if that is um, strictly based on materials or is that based on neighborhoods? Is that based on, 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 on what? I'd like just to just understand how you prioritize those risks and what those risks look like. Um, on the outreach piece, I'd love to know, beyond the organizations that, um, that you reached out to, did you re reach out to neighborhood associations uh, as well to solicit their feedback? And if not, I would encourage you to do that, especially if we follow some of these additional uh, outreach measures to let them know about the 14-day water supply, et cetera. And then lastly, um, if I'm sitting at home and we've had these other conversations about um, you know, the real challenges um, right now um, that a lot of families in our community have in terms of paying for rent or being able to afford a home here and groceries and gas and all the rest of it. So if I'm sitting at home watching this right now, I'm thinking, you've made the case for it, makes sense, agree with the plan, how's it going to impact me with under this new spending? Um, is, are we gonna, is that mainly going to be through uh, uh, ratepayer increases, it sounds like, or are we going to dip into some reserves as well? Or what's going to be the bottom line impact to our residents? And I know it's increasing small er every year and then a little bit larger near the end, but um, how are you going to calculate that in terms of commu and, and communicating that to, to, to residents that, uh, and this shouldn't be anything new. We've always, you know, with our, with our policy of continually reinvesting in our infrastructure, um, however, uh, they might want to start preparing now already for some of these rate increases. So thank you. I just want to remind everyone, this is a discussion we have yet to have as well. We, we will be having, but go ahead. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. So how, how did we prioritize the highest risk? And it's a combination of things. Um, we've identified where the backbones are. And so if we trace the backbone lines and we find that there is a susceptible material on that line, that automatically bumps it up to a high risk because we really want that line to be functioning. We also have mapped the ground accelerations that we expect. And so there's areas that are gonna move more. And so if our backbone's going through there, we wanna make sure that's really strong through there. But there's also, also things like water pump stations. So if there's a water pump station that isn't built to the newest design standards that are earthquake resilient, then we might wanna prioritize that pump station replacement because it's vital to be able to pump the water uh, in the case of the earthquake. Maybe I could address the, the uh, funding question. Um, so rate increases will eventually be needed to fund the new investments that we are proposing. Um, these will be considered as part of future budgets, and so more conversations on that. Mm -hmm. But we certainly will be seeking any available grant opportunities to help mitigate rate increases. Um, our plan would be to uh, implement um, a series of modest rate increases over a long period of time. 
uh, because that will help with affordability as well as make sure that each generation of customers that use the system pay their share of cost. Um, if we were to, say, uh, implement rate uh, increases, say, over a 20-year time frame as a rough order of magnitude, what that would look like is potentially one quarter of 1% rate increase each year. So that gives you a sense Thank you. of the type of so rate increase it would you. take to fund these investments. And then just the last question about the outreach to the neighborhood associations. I don't recall a reading if that happened. Um, I will uh, look into that, but it's, so the plan is directing us to do more, and that is definitely something that we can target in the future. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Barksdale. All right, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I don't have a lot of questions, just one. How, are we able to, do we have sensors like monitoring movement of our pipes currently? And I guess I'm just trying to get a sense of like how the system sort of gracefully transitions or, or fails over, um, like in the event of an, of an earthquake, for example. I, I get the post event, this happened, and how do we recover, you know, but what does it look like going up to that event? So the, the city currently has a SCADA system. This is a system that is connecting our uh, BSC, the Business Service Center, to things like pump stations. And so a pump station will tell us if it's in trouble. Um, we don't have anything on pipes, but if we start to see alarms along a line, we can surmise that something bad has happened in that area, and uh, we would quickly send crews out to investigate. Okay, is that is is it significant to have it sensors or uh, that sort of uh, visibility only at the pump station versus uh, along the pipe? Well, the, the pipes are connecting essentially the organs, right? And mm -hmm. so we have sensors on our organs. Yeah. And I, I said pump stations, but we also have sensors on reservoirs. Mm -hmm. So if there's, a, if there's a main break and we start to see a reservoir going down really quickly, we kind of can quickly identify what area do we need to focus on to make that uh, go down, turn some valves off, and make that water loss stop. Got it. I guess my, my last question, kind of building up to it, is just, is there anything that should be in the plan as well to, in terms of uh, predicting or kind of getting a sense of when there's a risk? Is there anything further that you think should be considered as part of the plan? Yeah, as part of our, our renewal and replacement program right now, we assign a risk to every length of pipe in the city. Okay. And then that, that risk is associated with its age and its material. And then now it's going to have a seismic vulnerability uh, factor part of it. And so, yeah, we have a risk-based approach to all of our projects that we do. Okay. Thank you. I support the recommendation. Thank you. Really good presentation. Really good uh, description in the packet as well, which I appreciated. Um, I think that preventative investments are some of the greatest work a municipality can do and I really appreciate the five years that you have spent coming up with this recommendation um, and five years that we didn't have to have an incident <laughs> fortunately so um, is this something that we can bring back on consent okay okay I'm going to ask the deputy mayor to make a motion sorry mayor I move to direct staff to return with the resolution to adopt the emergency water supply master plan on consent at a future meeting second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed great thank you so much and with that we are adjourned